Hey, thanks for taking the time to watch this video today. My name's Scott, I'm one of the pastors here at Fairfield Christian, and we just love that you are online trying to grow in your walk with Christ. Let me encourage you to not just make it an online habit. Uh, you can join us on Sundays at 9 and 10.30 for either one of our services, or if you have a church that you're connected to, we'd strongly encourage you uh, to get there as often as you can. Uh, we hope that this will help you and guide you along the way as you continue to grow in your walk for Christ. So please, sit back and enjoy the video. Merry Christmas, everybody. Three days. How many of you are done with your shopping? Wow, mostly ladies. Okay, cool. All right. How many of you already have your presents wrapped in under the tree? You bunch of overachievers. All right, men. How many of you still need to go shopping? Yeah. I am really excited about Christmas. I am so excited to see what our kids get. Um, I'm, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Anna and I share an Amazon account. I can look. Um, <laughs> I'm really excited. No, I love Christmas. I do. I absolutely love Christmas, but it's, it's, not, it's not in the weird, like the cookies, the, the, I, I love cookies. Look at me. Um, it's not in the songs. It's the lights and all that stuff. It's not in that. It, I just love Christmas for what it is because Christmas to me is the very beginning of our redemption story. It's the very beginning of the relationship that you and I have with Jesus. And I love Christmas for that. And I, I love that Jesus began his life here on earthly form. And, and in that first Christmas, he began to live his life. And the plans of God were put into motion. And I love that. But really, if you think about it, it didn't really start that first Christmas. It started about nine months prior. You see, today we're going to look at Mary. And if you got your Bible, you can open to Luke 1. We're going to camp in Luke 1 today. Um, if you got it on your phone and you got it in your, your actual Bible, you can open it up. We're going to camp there, but we're going to look at Mary's song, or Mary's Magnificat, as, as, as they would say. And we're going, to, we're going to dive into this, and we're going to see what we can learn about Mary. But I think it's really important for us to step out and make sure that we have the proper backstory on Mary. Who was she? You see, we know some things about Mary. We know, number one, that she was a virgin because the Bible tells us that. Um, we know that she was engaged or betrothed to be married to a man named Joseph. Now, engagement and all that stuff, that process in Bible times was a lot different than it was today, okay? It involved the dowry, it involved some payment, it involved some planning, and really, as soon as you were betrothed, in Bible times, you were basically married without living together. And what would happen is that then the groom would go off and he would prepare. So Joseph was off doing the things to get ready. Maybe he was building their house. Maybe he was getting his affairs in order, whatever it was. And then at some point, he would come and, and receive Mary and there would be a big party and, and then the marriage would be fully official and things like that. So we know she was engaged. We know she, according to history, uh, brides at that time were, were around 13, 14, 15 years old. So we know she was a young person. We know she was a teenager. And it just absolutely <laughs> amazes me. How amazing does that sound? Let me just say, we talk about handing the church to the next generation. God handed Jesus to a teenager. That's amazing. Let's never underestimate the power of teenagers good and bad. Okay? We'll just say. But we, we know that she was relatively young. We know that she lived in Nazareth, right? Because it says so. It said that he went to her and visited her in Nazareth. And, and let me just tell you, Nazareth was not some place that you would like want to go get a postcard from. There was nothing. In fact, fast forward 30 some years and Jesus' ministry went when one of the disciples was bringing his brother to Jesus. The disciple goes, can anything good come from Nazareth? It was a dump. It was, on, it was in a remote corner of the country, and, and from what I read, it, it kind of bordered the Gentile land, and it kind of became known as the Galilee of the Gentiles, which is very, very interesting to me, knowing that Jesus broke down the wall uh, of salvation for the Jews to the Gentiles, and so he went to this little town in Nazareth that was on the border and used a young lady named Mary. So we know all of these things about Mary. We know that Mary was from the line of David. Now, she was really, really far down the line, but she was from the lineage of David. Joseph was from the lineage of David, and that was really important because all the prophecies said it had to be from David. But that's what we know about Mary. We don't know a whole lot about Mary, and, and that is, there's nothing really special 
about Mary? What made her so special that God decided to use her? What was it that God saw that the world didn't see? See, Mary wasn't famous. She wasn't powerful. She wasn't wealthy. She wasn't influential. In fact, her name was incredibly common. Mary was just a common name in Bible times. What was it that made God want to bestow this honor on Mary? And we know she was favored because the Bible tells us so. And if you're in Luke 1, we're going to look at this. Look at what happened on the night that Mary found out that she was going to be a mom. Luke 1, in verse 26, it says, In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings. And here it is. Check this out. You who were highly favored. Now, what I don't want you to miss, it's capital L. The Lord is with you. It's the name of God. Now, I don't know if you know this or not. Um, Gabriel showing up to your house, kind of a big deal. It wasn't like Gabriel knocked on your door every Tuesday, like, can I borrow a cup of milk? Okay. It was like, who's that Gabriel? Send him away. No, Gabriel showing up at your house, kind of a big thing. Because he was like an archangel. He was Gabriel. Like he was the angel of the Lord. Like when he showed up, you listened. So we know that he was highly favored because God didn't just send an angel. He sent Gabriel. So we see the first time that she was favored. Then Mary finds out what's going to happen. She tells God, hey, let it be as you said. And she packs up and she goes, I'm going to go visit my relative. I'm going to go visit Elizabeth. And so she, she jumps in her car. Okay, you guys are with me. That's good. Okay, good. Verse 41, it says, When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, Mary shows up at Elizabeth's house. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb. I have no idea what that feels like. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. This is awesome. I love this, that the first person to celebrate Jesus was a preborn baby. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of it, here it is, capital L, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? You see, it was obvious in both of these situations that Mary was favored by God. But why? She was from Nazareth. She was young. She was, she was just Mary. Why? Why was she favored? Well, it, it's really simple. See, Mary was a nobody that believed that God was a somebody. See, Mary wasn't that special according to the world. It would be like, oh, she's Mary from Nazareth, no big deal, whatever, right? She didn't stand out. Now, don't get me wrong. It wasn't like she was weird or odd or like crazy or anything like that. She was just Mary until she became Mary, the mother of God. Jesus. See, she really was a nobody, but she knew that God was somebody. You ever stop to think in this whole story? This has bugged me for years. You ever stop to think in this whole story? Gabriel comes to Mary, tells Mary this is going to happen, that the Holy Spirit's going to come upon her and all this kind of stuff, and Mary asks one question. I read this story, and I have 37,000 questions. Do you? I got, I got a bunch of them. Mary asks one, and it's just a logistical question. She's like, how? That's all she asked. You ever wonder why? You ever wonder why she only asked one question? Some of you have kids. They ever ask just one question? <laughs> Not very often. <laughs> right? She asked one question, but part of this is because she knew who God was. She simply replied, let it be as you have said. She had full faith in God because she understood that God uses ordinary people to accomplish extraordinary things. All through the scriptures, we see this. If nothing else, we should be so encouraged by Mary because Mary was the definition of ordinary. And if God chose to use Mary in this incredible way, what could he do in your life, in your world? 
See, she was a nobody that God used to bring about salvation to everybody. He didn't need a queen or a king or somebody famous. All God used was a young lady who knew that God could do amazing things. If God can do that with Mary, he can do amazing things through you. Don't ever discount how big God is when it comes to using you. God wants to do great things through us. God wants to work in us and through us and use us as the vessel to impact the world. And God wants to use ordinary people. The question really is, is are you willing to allow God to use you his way? Mary was. You see, the only thing that seems to make Mary stand out is her full belief and faith and trust in God. And we get just a glimpse of that in her life. See, right after Mary visits Elizabeth, we get this glimpse into what Mary was thinking. It's like a little peek into her private journal, into her, 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 her thoughts, into her world, into what she is thinking. And God puts it in his word so we can see it. Now, I want to ask you to do something. As I read this passage, I want to ask you to do a couple things. One, I want you to count how many times Mary uses the words me or my, okay? And then I want you to count how many times he uses the words she uses the words he, him, or his. We're going to read 10 verses. So I want you to count. Here we go. Ready? Luke 1. We're going to start in verse 46. Check this out. It says, And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me, holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors." Okay, if you did it, how many times did Mary say me or my? Five times. How many times did she say he, him, or his? Thirteen. That's what I got, thirteen. Let that sink in for just a second. Why does that matter? Why does it matter? She says me or my five times, and she says he, him, or his. And I told you before that a lot of times little words in the Bible mean a big thing. You see, when you really look at it all, Mary talks about what God has done for her personally, how she feels about what God has done. That's the me or the my part. And then she spends a whole lot of time, a whole bunch of verses, talking about what God has done for his people. How he takes down the proud and the rulers and the prideful. How he's saving them. How he shakes things up and he puts the world on notice and goes counter to the culture. All, and in fact, all of Mary's mys or me's in her song point to what God has done. It just, just overflows with faith in who God is. Now, put yourself in Mary's shoes for just a second. What would your journal entry look like in this moment? If I'm being really, really honest, and I... And I don't know that if I was in Mary's shoes, in this exact moment, I would be pointing out all the things that God has done because of the issues that I was currently facing. You know, being an unwed mother, getting ready to raise the Son of God. That might have taken my focus off of God and put it on me and my issues. But this is what made Mary so amazing in that she was used by God. So you see it in this song. Mary knew who God was and put her faith in God and her trust in God. And when this amazing visit from, God, from Gabriel happened, she trusted him. I think that's why she didn't ask a bunch of questions. That's why she didn't need the entire plan laid out, because she didn't need all the answers, because she trusted that God knew and God had a plan. But go back to her song. Did you notice how often she gives God credit for all that he has done? Now, keep in mind, Mary was 13 to 15 years old. Listen, I have a 14-year-old daughter. And thinking about my daughter having to deal with something like this just freaks me out. I could not imagine 
someone that age going through this, but Mary handles it with grace. Now, I want to step off and tell you, just as a youth guy, it is absolutely amazing to me that God entrusted Jesus to a teenager. And Gabriel poured into her, and Elizabeth poured into her. Just think about what God can do through the teenagers in this church if we continue to pour into them. It's amazing. We love handing things to the next generation. Let's keep doing that. God is going to do amazing things through the next generation in this church. I fully believe that. Let's keep building them up. But we take a glimpse into Mary's journal, and it shows this young lady was the perfect person because of her faithfulness and her willingness to be surrendered. See, she was willing to risk her life, and she really would have been doing that because Joseph had options. Joseph could have had her stoned, her family could have disowned her. There was a lot of things that could have happened in her life. And she didn't that. She didn't worry about it. Mary's entire song is all about what God had done. And she came to a realization that every single one of us has to understand. That God uses me because of who he is, not who I am. It should be incredibly comforting to know that God uses people because of who he is not because of who we are, right? God's power in us and through us can do amazing things. You see, Mary was the first person to have the Spirit of Jesus actually living in her. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, we get to experience that each and every day as we walk with Him. See, Mary knew who God was. He knew his, she knew His nature. She knew His character. I mean, look at the verses. You go back through Mary's song, merciful, gracious savior he's done great things she knows who god is she knows what he's doing through her so when you hear the song mary did you know yes she knew now some of you are like you just ruined that song for me you jerk <laughs> mary did you know that when you kiss this little baby you kiss the face i was there yeah i know i got it i know i don't know if she knew all the details but she knew it was the son of god she was there Mary, did you know? Yeah, thank you, I got it. Appreciate it. She knew. She knew the whole story. She knew what was going to happen. In her song, she said, Savior. She knew what he was coming to do. She may not have known how, but she knew. But she sees that God is using her because of who he is. Not because of there was something about Mary that just was attractional to God. Not because that there was something special about her talents or special about her abilities, or special about her look, or special about anything that. See, we don't talk about Mary because of Mary. We talk about Mary because of Jesus. We don't talk about Mary because she was pretty and she was a great mom. I could argue different. She did lose her son. But we talk about Mary because of what God did in her life. God chose Mary to be the mother of the Son of God, and that makes Mary an important part of our faith. And it's weird, because if Mary wasn't faithful and humble to begin with, if she wasn't a servant of God, do you think God would have really chose her? It's the beauty of the omniscience of God. But God did, not because of what Mary could do. He chose Mary because of who Mary was in her innermost being. And because of that favor in her life, Mary is part of the nativity today. I want you to understand something. We wouldn't be talking about Mary without Jesus because God's favor makes my life more impactful than I could ever imagine. You see, the Christian life is full of these countercultural ideas. Mary was a nobody who knew God was a somebody, and because of God's favor in her life, her life has been impactful for generation upon generation upon generation. And the Christian life is full of this, right? Jesus told us that if you want to be first, you have to be if you want to be the greatest, you have to be, right? If you want to be served, then you have to. He even told you that if you want to experience peace, you got to go through trouble. But it's God's favor in our life that makes our life so much more impactful. You see, Jesus said it, he modeled it, and Mary gave up what she had planned in her life to submit to the will of God. Listen, you don't think Mary had a plan? I got married 17 years ago. My wife had a plan. Mary had a Pinterest board full of wedding stuff. She had a Pinterest board of what her family... She didn't really have a Pinterest board, everybody. Okay, I'm just kidding. But she had a Pinterest... She had, she had a plan. She knew what she wanted her family to look like. 
And nowhere in that plan was um, be a parent to the Son of God. But the moment that God showed up in her life and poured his favor out on her, she was willing to put her plan aside and say, okay, let it be as you have said. Let it be as you have said. She recognized that what God had planned for her was so much better than what she could have ever imagined. If we can live our lives with God's favor, our lives are going to outlast us. If we can live in God's favor, generations will be impacted and lives will be changed because God is going to work through us and work through you and work through me. Now, it doesn't mean that our life is going to be easy. You see, Mary's life was anything but easy. We don't see Mary have this glamorous life. It started with giving birth in a barn. Then within the next few years, the king went a little crazy and tried to kill off all the kids, and they had to run in the middle of the night. I don't know if you've ever tried to go on vacation really, really quickly with a two-year-old. They had to flee to Egypt to get away from Herod. Then they got to come back to, to the city once Herod was gone and the new Herod took over, right? They didn't have an easy life. According to the world standards, their life was not smooth. It was not easy. It was not anything. But what she did have was the favor of God. And I want you to understand that God's favor and people's favor are often two very different things. You can be in favor with people and not God, and you can be in favor with God and not with people. But Mary always came back to this journal entry. She came back to this song. She came back to this set of verses that she had just said. And they were revolutionary because Jesus came to shake things up. He came to change the status quo. He came to break down the walls of religion to give everybody a chance at the relationship. And from the very beginning, Mary knew that life was going to be very, very different. And she didn't run from it. She didn't ask a bunch of questions to make sure that life was going to be okay. It's amazing to me that she didn't even ask if her life was going to be spared when she found out she was going to be raising the Son of God. But the moment that God confirmed his favor in his life through Gabriel and through Elizabeth, Mary accepted it. She stopped everything she was doing, and she celebrated. Listen, when I recognize God's power in my life, I can't help but celebrate. There is something amazing that happens when you recognize that God is using you. You get this amazing feeling that you just want to celebrate what God is doing. I, I can't explain it. I, I, I can't really explain it. I told you to pay attention to how many times Mary used the word he, him, or his, right? We kept 13 and 10 verses. She isn't singing a song about how amazing she is. She's not standing up there going, take a look at me now. And this is why I don't sing in the band. No. She talks about how amazing God is and how he's the savior and how he's merciful and how he's taking care of Israel and how he's taking care of everything else. And you, when you read the song, there really isn't anything about Mary in it. She stops. Even when she mentions herself, it's based in the fact that God looked down and chose to use a humble, lowly, Nazareth servant girl to bring about redemption for the world. Listen, the moment God uses me for anything in my life I have to fight the urge to make it about me I gotta fight the urge to make it about me and look at what God's doing in my life and it's an emphasis thing because I go look at what God's doing in my life and I become the humble brag and I begin to like oh no God is so amazing and look at what he's doing in in my life and oh my goodness it's amazing but really I want y'all just look at me and that's not right Mary doesn't do that. Mary is like, no, listen, this is who God is. I'm going to put God at the forefront. I'm going to put God at the front of the line, and I'm going to say, this is who God is. So don't be afraid to celebrate what God is doing in your life. You can celebrate it like crazy. I, do got, I have people in my life that send me those text messages just simply, God is amazing. That is one of the coolest text messages you could ever get from somebody. Three words. God is amazing. Man, that's awesome. We get to do this, right? So if this was you, again, put yourself in Mary's shoes. Would your song be like Mary's song? Or would it be more focused on you than God? 
I know for me, it would be a struggle. We should celebrate everything God does in and through us. Like some churches, like this service that we're in right now, some churches call them celebration services. It doesn't really matter what you call them, but the whole idea is that they want to come in and celebrate all that God has done in the lives of the people that are in that church. They want to celebrate all that God does. Last service, we sang our living hope at the very end after the message, and it was cool to sit right here and listen to it just crescendo and get louder. And as people really bought into the words of that song, it just got louder and louder and louder. And it was, it was just amazing. Like, it was so cool. Celebrate. It's okay. Celebrate all that God is doing. And when you recognize God is working in your life, when you see that he's using you to do something in his will, by all means, celebrate. But keep the focus on him. Don't humble brag. Don't make it about you. He could just as easily use the person on the other side of the room as he uses you. Now, maybe you're sitting here and you're thinking about your life. And maybe you've never felt like God has used you. Maybe you've never felt like this. Like, Scott, I've never felt this. Listen, I get it. I get it. There are times where I sit in in your seat or I sit in my office and I go, man, God is doing some really cool things in the lives of other people. And then I look and I go, "Um, hey, God, right? What are you doing? I get it. You would think working at a church, like God would just like ring me on the phone and go, hey, you're going to do this. You're going to do that. You're going to do this. And it's going to be amazing. And and like God's just going to just shine out of my eyes and just glow. And often I miss it. I tell you time and time again when I'm up here on the stage about the failures in my life and how I missed God moving. And God usually has to get my attention somehow. Or, or God's got to grab me and go, hey, yoo come on back. All right? So maybe it's been a long time that you felt God's power in your life. Maybe you've never felt it. Maybe you've denied it. But I do believe it ultimately comes down to one question. This whole thing with Mary and what makes Mary so special comes down to one question. Am I prepared to be used by God? Mary was. Am I prepared? You see, we talk about Mary, and there was nothing extraordinary about Mary that we know of. There was not anything that made her stand out, except, and I discovered this even more as I was studying this passage this week, Mary was full of faith in God. She knew the stories, and when she faced the moment where life really was in the balance, the Word of God just came out of her. It just began to come out of her. She wasn't forcing it. She wasn't trying to recall it. It was just who she was. Let me me show you what I mean. See, there was a story in the Old Testament in 1 Samuel about this, this lady named Hannah. Now, Hannah was barren. She couldn't have children for some reason, and and if you know kind of Bible culture— one of the biggest blessings in a lady's life was to have kids. And if they weren't, it, it was looked upon with a little bit of shame and a little bit of things. And so Hannah went to the priest, and she was praying, and she was praying, and, and she promised God. She said, God, if you give me a child, I will give him back to you. Eli goes, hey, God has heard your prayer. God is going to honor that. Hannah goes back home. She ends up getting pregnant. She gives birth to this person that we know by the name of Samuel. 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, big-time prophet, anoints David, so many other things. That's Hannah's son. Now, here's a really cool thing. That happened in 1 Samuel 1. In 1 Samuel 2, she prays this prayer. And I want you to listen to this prayer and tell me that some of these things don't sound exactly like Mary's song. You ready? Check this out. In 1 Samuel 2, verse 1, Hannah prays. She says, "'My heart rejoices in the Lord.'" In the Lord, my horn is lifted up. Go to Mary's song. She says, my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Hannah prayed, there is no one holy like the Lord. Mary, for the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. Now, I could go on and on and on and on, but it's interesting. While she is not quoting Scripture, she's not quoting the Old Testament, but during this time of praise, the thoughts and meanings of Scripture are coming out. They're coming out in her words and her thoughts. Mary was prepared to be used by God because she had spent time connecting with God. She had spent time in the temple listening to the stories. She had spent time. And I believe that this was the reason that Mary was favored by God. Because she knew, because God knew that in Mary's heart, 
she was willing to trust God in whatever way he wanted. She had faith. She had invested the time, and she knew the very nature of God. When you go back and read Mary's song, she describes the very nature of God. Holy, merciful, gracious, Savior. And it challenges me, sitting in my office this week, going, okay, am I really prepared to be used by God? And so I flip it around, are you? What are you doing to fill yourself with the knowledge of God? Are you investing in that relationship? Maybe today is the day for you to step out and step into that relationship, to lean into Jesus, to lean into his character and his nature. Look at your life. What do you need to do to be ready for a moment like Mary's? What do you need to do to be ready? The more filled with the knowledge and the spirit of God, the easier it is to hear and respond to his voice. Take a step today. Let me challenge you. Maybe this week you need to commit to spending a few moments with God each day. There's some easy ways you can do that. There's a version Bible app that you can put on your phone with devotionals. There's Right Now Media. We pay for it. We'll give it to you for free. All you got to do, put your email on the Connect card and drop it in the offering and say, right now, and, and we'll give it to you. There's other ways to do that. But if you want to do that and you want accountability, man, write it on a card. Let us know, hey, I'm going to commit to spend time with Jesus every day. And we'll see if we can figure out a way to help keep you accountable with that. Maybe that's you. Maybe you need to spend more time with him. Maybe you need to commit to a group. Maybe you need to commit, you know what? I need a community of believers that are going to come around me and love me so that when everything goes wrong in my life or when I feel God speaking to me, I can step into that group and go, hey guys, this is what I feel God doing. Can you pray for me? Maybe today you need to start a relationship with Jesus. Let me tell you, there is no greater Christmas present that you can give yourself than to begin a relationship with the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the one person that gave his life for you when you didn't deserve it. So if that's you today, let me challenge you. Start a relationship with Jesus, and all you got to do is talk to him. You say, God, I need you. God, I want you in my life. God, I know that I'm a sinner, and I need to be saved by you. God, start a relationship with me. God, I want that. But then you got to tell somebody. Mark it on your card. Grab a prayer team member. Come see me after service. Grab a staff member. Whatever it is, start that relationship. Whatever it is for you, there's 300 of you in here. Whatever it is that God is putting on your heart, listen. And when you see God working in your life, celebrate because God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. Celebrate. Even if you think it's something small, celebrate. You know, the beauty of it is that our life will go way beyond us when we spend it serving in the kingdom of God. Let me tell you, there's something amazing about Jesus. He does amazing things. He makes our life so much more impactful because he is our living hope.